So we're really honored to have Steve Strymer back with us. He was here last year um, and returning to talk on a slightly different topic now, but Steve has been a passionate researcher for many years on um, subjects relating to local history, egalitarian activism, anti-slavery activism, communitarianism, um, and unearthing and sharing uh, really um, important um, histories that many of us were not aware of until he made, made us aware of them. Um, and he's recently opened the David Ruggles Center, um, which is in Florence, and it's open on Sundays from 11 to 2. Right? And um, it's a museum and an informal archive of materials um, pertaining to these histories. So that's very exciting that that has just opened a month ago. All right, thank you all, and without further ado, thank you so much, Steve. Uh, I do come, um, in a sense, on behalf of Historic Northampton. We're in the middle of a membership drive. We were lucky enough to have a $25,000 anonymous matching donation. For every membership we can garner this year, there will be matched 100% if we can raise $25,000 on our side. So. There's so much going on at Historic Northampton, even, say, this afternoon, 11 to 3, Faith Deering of the David Ruggles Center is going to give a talk. She's a, a historical entomologist at Historic Deerfield, and she's going to be talking about all things silk and silkworms. She's going to bring her own silkworms there. Uh, should be quite exciting. They're creepy little creatures, but she, <laughs> she can make them talk. So no, usually I just <clears throat> launch into it. But I've noticed that I occasionally enjoy um, talks by academics where they actually prepare something. <laughs> Sometimes, I mean, some, but so I'm going to break with my typical pattern and start out by reading a statement, basically, uh, to give some background about what we're going to do. Um, here we go. It isn't as if Florence had entirely forgotten its progressive past before Paul Gaffney Fran Krumpholtz, and finally Christopher Clark, refocused our attention in the 1990s on just how vital a role Florence had played in the antebellum Northeast. The aspirations of the Northampton Association of the early 1840s had clearly resounded with the immediate descendants of its utopian founders. Arthur G. Hill, the son of Samuel L. Hill, one of the founders and a longtime treasurer, the longtime treasurer of the association, wrote several recollections of his times growing up in an abolitionist community. The most provocatively titled of his writings was Florence, the Mecca of the Colored Race. He had thought better of this original title, crossing out Mecca and replacing it with the blander sanctuary of the colored race. Even then, at the turn of the century, in this free-thinking community gathered at Cosmian Hall, for his talk before the Free Congregational Society, he might have been a little too strong, this might have been a little too strong a statement of how the activism of his parents and friends had resulted in a safe haven for formerly enslaved African Americans. Arthur's nephew, Charles Sheffield, took the effort of remembering a step further and ordered his remembrances of the people who had formed this community. He wrote and edited the essential history of Florence, including a complete account of the Northampton Association of Education and Industry, um, a wonderful book. And we sell it at the Ruggles Center for $15. We've created a facsimile copy of it. Sheffield and many of his contributors, including Frederick Douglass, took time to remember a place where there was no distinction of rights or rewards between the strong and the weak, the skillful and unskillful, the man and the woman, the rich and the poor, that asked only of all honest effort according to ability. Okay, this is the this is the quintessential radical statement uh, of all social experiments and of society, frankly. Here, for once, was a community committed to the radical equality of the human race, where every woman, every African American, even statedly fugitive slaves, would have an equal vote with the white men. Occasionally, historians would try to assess the value of this association, and for the most part, concluded it an impractical failure, more a cautionary tale than an inspiration to future generations. 
All that has now changed. Their farm is now the Grow Food Northampton farm. Cooperatives, based on their early model of one person, one vote, flourish in the valley, and the Sojourner Truth Memorial statue and the David Ruggles Center honor their attempt to form a society based on equal rights and full participation. Northampton still benefits from the results of their striving. Hill Institute, the first free endowed kindergarten in the, country, in the US, still functions as such today. The Lilly Library thrives. The Florence Casket Company, begun as a cooperative of carpenters, is Florence's longest running business. And Lilly Hall at Smith College, the first building dedicated to the education of women in science, still stands. But best known to all of us is the Florence Savings Bank, <clears throat> which with its precursor, the Working Man Savings Bank, testifying to the enduring legacy of these practical dreamers. What has interested me most over these last 15 years has been to look for what remains in the built and natural landscapes of these practical idealists who so fully dreamed of the possibility of true equality. It was no Camelot. But at the beginning, <clears throat> a modest and hard scrabble existence. Perhaps the most remarkable finding is that so many of these humble houses remain. Out here where urban renewal left us mostly untouched. So let's start with what was known back before 2000, when the advent of the Sojourner Truth Memorial Statue and the Florence History Project began to bring things into focus. <clears throat> so he, here are the houses that we knew of, that we being people uh, throughout Florence history who cared about history, they would point to this house and say, oh, that's, and still not that many of them. So here's number, this is number one. This is the Ross Homestead. This is the seat of the Grow Food Northampton Farm, in a way, if it were part of that, that uh, agricultural department of the Northampton Association. It's the only building of the Northampton Association still on its original foundation. It's on the National Register for Underground Railroad and also in, uh, part of the uh, Underground Railroad Network to Freedom. I'm going to talk not too much about these older houses. This is Basil Dorsey's second house. Basil Dorsey, we'll talk about him later was a fugitive slave. This is at 4 Florence Road, a very modest little house. Um, and, but this is his second house. And that led to part of the confusion, because that was the Basil Dorsey house, if you know what I mean. This is Samuel L. Hill's house. I mentioned Samuel L. Hill before. Um, he uh, really parlayed the assets of the Northampton Association into the industrial village of Florence, almost single-handedly in a way working with other industrialists to build up Florence as, uh, as what we see today. Uh, this is the, a friend of his, Hiram Wells, right across the street. He was, uh, the Florence sewing machine was invented in his factory. Um, this is the home of C.R. Dorsey. Um, a while back, the PAL, uh, the uh, Public Archaeology Laboratory, came to Florence and looked at African American history, and they wrote up the Form B talk a little bit about Form Bs. That's the first step toward a National Register nomination. We have maybe 1,200 of them in Northampton. Oh, Norton, you would do that to me. You would do that to me, right? OK. Oh, tip of the month. Yeah. Oh, that's the beauty of the house. Uh, yes, and that's just been renovated. I mean. You know, this is a, a lovely renovation of this house. Yeah. The brackets and everything is really great. Right across from the statue, right on Pine Street near the statue. Um, this is the William Haven House. Uh, um, and you can see it's been added to, you know, in true Victorian state, uh, style. This is the uh, Hall and Francis Judd House. So they knew about these houses. They had Form Bs back in the 70s. There was a huge uh, project of, of writing up these houses back for the bicentennial, and that's mostly where a lot of them came. Um, and this is the George Hill Leander Langdon house, which doesn't have a Form B to this day, I found out, looking in for preparing here. So uh, I talked to City Hall, and we can write up new Form Bs and get them registered with the state. This is an important 
an important house for many reasons. Leander Langdon was a great inventor. He invented the Florence sewing machine. He invented the miter box that you know and love as carpenters. He invented a, a, a very widely distributed miter box for which he had a patent. Uh, George Hill was uh, Samuel L. Hill's nephew, and this was a great orchard, and it still really appears like it was down on Nonotuck Street at 98 Nonotuck. And this, uh, finally, is um, <coughs> the, uh, the home of the Rosses, part of the Ross homestead, really. Um, and this is where Abel Ross, Austin Ross's uncle, who was the man of money that helped Austin Ross buy the Ross homestead after the days of the community. Uh, Abel Ross lived here. Um, Judge Mike Ryan now owns this house, which I'm very happy about. Uh, also a member of the board of North Historic Northampton, so we have somebody really who cares about history living in this house. I love that when that happens. <laughs> okay, so that's where we stood. Um, in 1985, the documents of the Northampton Association resurfaced at auction. They'd been lost for a hundred years, this utopian community I talked about. And this historian, Christopher Clark, latched on to them like nobody had ever latched on to a set of documents, in my view. This is a wonderful book, if you can get it it's out there. Uh, it's been picked up by UMass Press. But this really started this modern, uh, period we're in of reasserting the importance of the Northampton Association. So here's our first house. When the Sojourner Truth statue was going to go in in 2002, our committee felt it would be a good idea to tell people where her house had been. Nobody at that time thought her house had survived. Um, so we set about it, you know, trying to figure it out. I go up to Elise Feely and Jim Parsons and all these local historians, ask them what they thought happened to the house. Each one had a different story, right? It had been torn down, it had been uh, moved and then burned down with the Florence Hotel, right? All these different stories, which kind of says, well, nobody really knows, okay? Um, so, this is, oh, I'm so sorry, I'm sorry, sorry. where is that house? Oh, I'm sorry, this is 35 Park Street. Is it anywhere near that statue or is it? It is, it's down the street from the statue. And that park that the statue is on has long been a park. So this would have been a park where she would have walked down to. Mm -hmm. um, probably, you know, it shows up, it was always held aside in this, uh, we're going to talk about Eaton's Village Lots. It's part of Eaton's Village, Village Lots. Uh, it just got sold, so we're in process of, of uh, discreetly making contact. <laughs> because it got away from us. The owners, there was a miscommunication. The owners uh, just put it on the market. And we didn't find out about it in time. I, I went crazy one weekend trying to get Nell Payne, all these historians to buy it. For but we'll see. It should be fine. It is, after all, a house. So that's so. Uh, I'll go back. So Jenner Truth. This is what she really looked like. This this is this is the sitting that is her in 1851, and it really is the likeness that is uh, you know captured in bronze in the statue. So this is her at, uh, uh, in 1851. She would have been 54 years old at this point, right? And this is Florence was where she lived uh, during that period. And um, one of, uh, this is Arthur G. Hill I mentioned earlier. Grew up in the com community, born at the Ross Homestead. Born at 123 uh, Meadow Street, son of Samuel L. Hill, and uh, the author of many anti-slavery uh, uh, remembrances. This is him as a member, uh, the shortstop on the Eagle baseball team, the first, <laughs> the first integrated baseball team in the country, we believe four years earlier than the Oberlin College team of 1869. We believe their 1865 team with Luther Askin playing on it was the first integrated team in the country. Brian Turner, a great local historian, has basically confirmed this. And was that team based in this area? In Florence. It was a, it was a, group, it was a group of uh, kids who weren't old enough to go off to the war 
and they learned the new game of baseball and played it while, while the troops were on the, fighting the Civil War. As the war wound down, uh, they, uh, the troops themselves were playing the new game of baseball and became very good at it. And the Eagle team was challenged to a match with the returning, I believe, 10th Regiment and pinned their ears back. <laughs> and had an amazing record, like 57 and 8. Won the, won the silver ball in Western Mass. All these, you know, these kids. And two mayors of Northampton came out of this team, him being one of them. So, one of his recollections, and really where it started for us to be able to find the house, was this recollection, Anti-Slavery Days in Florence. I'll just read a little bit of it. It's really great stuff, all this stuff. This hasn't been transcribed or published yet, which we'll probably do pretty shortly. Sojourner Truth, whose real name was Isabella von Wagen, Wagner, it was Wag, Wagener, lived here for several years, having the house built for her, now occupied by a Mrs. Lyman Abbott on Park Street. Okay? Um, every time Arthur G. Hill had a chance to mention who was now living in Sojourner Truth's house, he did. <laughs> Later on, Mr. Waite owns her, owns her house, you know. And uh, so he certainly remembered her house. Um, and this is his Florence Mecca of the co Colored Race, uh, for page one, where uh, he remembers that Mrs. Mr. Waite owned the house uh, later on. But um, well, we, one of the great maps, I wish this was displaying a little better, but this is the 1879 bird's eye view of Florence. Um, I'm talking about the elements that led to the discovery that her house was still there. This was a major one. Um, here's her deed. Okay, This is the deed to Sojourner Truth's house for lot number 11 in Eaton's Village Lots. Um, and it's uh, April 15, 1850, with a house already on it. So if we're trying to get down to where, and we haven't done any dendrochronology on this house to date the tree rings like we have uh, on other houses, but um, we hope to do that with the new owners. This is Eaton's Village Lots, the lot plan that Samuel Hill laid out just as the community was breaking up in 1846. They left all the assets, all the liabilities to Samuel Hill to sort out. <laughs> and, you know, really. And he was I would guess, happy to do it, because he trusted himself as a businessman and probably in the end didn't trust a lot of the people he had worked with. <laughs> they had actually started thinking, some of the leaders, you know in the, in the minutes of their meetings, they were already making this transition to what they called the neighborhood community. They called it that. So it's a wonderful thing, and it leads to the kind of idea that this utopian community never died, finally. I mean, never really just went away. Uh, so here is lot number 11 in Eaton's Village Lots. Samuel L. himself lived here, and he provided Sojourner Truth with her mortgage for her house. So here's a detail of that 1879 bird's eye view, okay? And what we see is, uh, this is the, all right, so here we are. This is the same Eaton's Village Lots. That, we, that Samuel Hill laid out with his brother-in-law, his brother Edwin Eaton. And this is Sojourner Truth's house. Okay? Looking nothing like it does today. Right? And with an empty lot next to it. This is lot number 10. Can you point out like where uh, 9 and Maple are? And Pine Street, yeah. <coughs> where you're right where here. Um, Right here, this is the VF, uh, VFW, this is the Methodist Church, uh -huh. okay, this is Cosme Hall, this isn't Route 9 going up to, to Main Street, okay. This is where the Florence Hotel was, where our new building is in Florence, which uh, I, you know, people may, that, may think that building's a little weird there to be in Florence, but when you think about the feel of that, right. on that corner, right. There was a massing of a building there on that corner for many, many years. So what you're feeling there with that building kind of feeling close, that's how Florence felt. So I'm very happy about that building being there. That's Maple? Um, you didn't say what that this is. is. This is Maple here. This is Samuel Hill's house at 33 Maple. Okay. Um, 
And the other is pine then coming and this, down? Uh, this is pine. Uh -huh. Where's the Hill Institute today? The Hill, Hill Institute, Institute yeah, this is Samuel Hill's house. Uh -huh. The Hill Institute is cut off, but it's right there. Right up there, yeah. Okay, right behind Samuel Hill's house. Because he really built it because the kindergarten overran his parlors. That's where he started. <laughs> so within a year, he built the, the Hill Institute. <clears throat> All right, so here's the culprit in a way. This is really the culprit. In 1857, Sojourner Truth sells off uh, all of her property to Daniel Ives. And this is the 1870, uh, detail of the 1873 Beers Atlas, the, the most widely distributed atlas of Hampshire County. Um, you get copies everywhere on this. And if you look, here's Daniel Ives. Right? And Anybody who started to research, uh, who cared to, and, there were, and, and believe me, this is, part of our story is, there weren't that many people that cared. Weirdly, in Northampton, the statue really began this new thing of caring about this history. Yeah. Um, before that, there weren't that many. It wasn't, it wasn't like you had meetings and people would show up to talk about it or anything. Um, so at any rate, if you did care, you saw that Daniel Ice was right there and the owner of the house. Uh, Kimball House, you know, like many people, said, "Well, my building, at, uh, my house is here. This house, you know, that, that's where the house was." Well, what had happened? This is the story of the Beers Atlas. Uh, there's a great, uh, the former sur surveyor of the town of Amherst, uh, James Avery Smith, is a map expert. I met met with him. I said, "What do you think of the Beers Atlas?" He says, "It's notoriously inaccurate." In 1856, Sojourner Truth bought lot number 10. Remember that before, where I point out lot number 10, that empty lot? Still empty as of 1879. She bought lot number 10. So she owned all this property right here, right down to West Center Street. And what we found out, and this is what Jim told me, <clears throat> the Beers people would send people out in the field to do a sketch of the building outline. To a, a rough sketch of what the, your house, you know, the approximate footprint of your house, and then they would plop it down on the legal lot, in the middle of the legal lot. Okay, so that's why you see Daniel Ives' house in the middle of the combined uh, lot number ten and lot number eleven. Um, that's my. That's what he and I both came up with. That must be what we're seeing here. The 1884 map duplicates this. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so we go, okay, so every other deed, every other map, but the beers map, that's every deed, every other map, pointed to the fact that the house was right there. We measured out what, uh, what uh, the Eaton's Village lots, you know, how far down on the lot it would be. And so we go, this has to be, we, we think it is. So we do and we started what has become our pattern is we put together a packet for Kimball House and and, say, and knock on the, basically knock on the door. Kimball was a customer at Collective Company. They said, can we come into your house and just check it out? So we brought Bill Flint from Historic Deerfield and Bob Paint. We came with big guns, right? Bill, uh, Bill Flint and Bob Painter because we were pretty sure. And they looked all around the house. And um, one of the things that we looked at, and this is a photo taken by our own Amanda Herman here, uh, uh, for a great piece we did together on the hidden story of Florence in the now sadly gone Pioneer Magazine. Right? And if anybody saw the Pioneer Magazine out for a while, it was a great magazine. Uh, so this is Amanda going up in the attic of that house. And what are we seeing there? We're seeing the old, rafter of oh, the yeah. story and a half house that we saw in the mm. bird's eye view. The other thing I learned from James Avery Smith, those bird's eye views are good for knowing what the house looked like because the goal of the map maker was to sell you the map in a region. So if you, you, you wouldn't want to, you know, your house needs to look like it did. So they all look, if you go around that map, they all look like they did. And we went down, this is another Amanda picture, which I really love, uh, down in the basement. It was really something for Kimball to let us in and, and do that. He's getting on, but he was happy to do it. So this is the rough stamp stone foundation. 
And in every corner of the main frame of the building, you see old timber framing posts in the. So we were sure this was no, it, this didn't look like it, you know, because if you look at the house now, it looks like, uh, you know, a turn of the century mill house. Mm -hmm. sort of. Yeah. Okay, so um, I'll just mention, because I don't have the slides up there for that. So this was a picture, and I should have it up there, so I'll think about it. Um, this is a picture from Sheffield's history, and it's the only picture where you have Schultz Sojourner Truth House mentioned. And it was published in Nell Painter's biography of Sojourner Truth, and without any captions down here. And so you said, you know, this is the only big house. You don't even see her house, which is down here, this little black outline <laughs> way down here, right? So we blew it up, and I'm going to go back to the picture of the house. It took too long. So we go back to the picture of the house, and here's what, here's what that looks like blown up. And you see this triangle coming up here? Yeah. That's this wing of the house. Um. So Bob, this is Bob Painter, what he put together. This was built first and is appearing over the top of the original uh, story and a half house, right? And then the, it was raised, this part was raised, popped up. And uh, in the old days, and you see it here because um, the entrance was on, the entrance was on this side of the house. So that this was part, this was facing down this way um, in the original house. So, you may have trouble ever getting it on the National Register because of those problems. It doesn't oh. appear like it did in its day of historic importance. That's a key aspect of, but we may get an exception. She actually wrote her narrative so as to pay off her mortgage to Samuel Hill. That was one of her main goals, right? And uh, here's a, a wonderful piece. She goes out, and one of the great stories, not apocryphal as it turns out completely, uh, she walked out to and over to meet with Harriet Beecher Stowe, arrived at her house unannounced while Stowe's having a party, right? A six foot tall African American <laughs> woman she's never seen before arrives at her door, uh, bites herself in, and demands, basically, that Stowe write her a puff. This is what her puff is for promoting her narrative. And it's a, it's a wonderful piece, and this is hard to read, but I think it's worth giving a try, because it gives you a, an important thing about what phase of her life she was in when her narrative came out. Her object in the sale of this little work is to secure a home for her old age, and the kind-hearted cannot do better than to assist her in this effort. Those who have not read this narrative will find it worth the small sum paid to gain so new and original history of the workings of the human soul under slavery. Right? But She's looking for a, her object in the sale of this little house is to secure a home for her old age, right? She's 54. <laughs> she hasn't given the I woman speech yet, right? Mm -hmm. As it turns out, when you think about it, she was one of Ruggles' last patients. In fact, she was one of his first patients at the water cure. We're going to talk about David Ruggles, great African American Underground Railroad agent who came to. Uh, Florence to run a water cure treatment facility. Well, not two, but he ended up establishing a water cure treatment facility. Okay, he, she was one of his first patients and one of his last patients. And so she, I'm guessing, and that was 1849, right? Just as this was happening, that she was in bad health at that time and was presenting as a person kind of disabled or at least hobbling. And right, Ruggles kind of helped to fix her up. She really thought she, his, the, the treatment helped her. And after this, right, starting it with the a I a Woman speech and, and the Worcester Convention in 1850. And really all of this starting with the response in the African American community of abolitionists to the Fugitive Slave Act, which we're gonna talk about, of mm -hmm. September of 1850. She, Douglas, anybody were on the road perpetually to the Civil War after that. I mean, it was a great mobilizing thing, that Fugitive Slave Act. Okay, so um, that's the Journal Truth's house. Any questions about that before we go on? Um, we're hoping for the best outcome with the new owner. I sick Wendy. I sick Wendy on the new owner. 
thought it might be better than me going again. Do we know why she did leave the house? Why she left? Um, no, we don't know exactly why. She, uh, in her narrative, she, uh, not in her narrative, um, no, it's in a later version of the narrative. Uh, she said friends from Ulster County. She was a, a slave in New York State. Friends from Ulster County had moved to Battle Creek and invited her to come out there. But when you think about it, her, her sphere of influence was in the Midwest a lot. Um, Amy Post, she stated, Amy Post, and, and, and Florence was no longer the community she signed up for. If you think about Sojourner Truth, she lived in three utopian communities in her life, right? The Kingdom of Matthias in New York, which we won't go into, but look it up. <laughs> um, the Northampton Association, and then Harmonia, a spiritualist community in Battle Creek is where she went. Florence had become a much more rowdy place, right? Uh, a real burgeoning factory place. And she was just old sojourner. Out in the Midwest, she was sojourner, right? Yeah. Uh, this is just me, okay? There's nobody, nobody knows for sure. But th that's kind of what I've come up with thinking about it. Harmonia was a community already that she went to. Yeah. So that right. was it, yeah. yeah. So she joined that third community. So while we're up on Eaton's Village Lots, and I did this thing here, you know, I did, I roughly followed it. I, I kind of went back, and, and these are one of the things I enjoy about just what, because I, I love it so much. These are all my old notebooks. You know, this is how many notebooks of stuff is in here about going to the deed. Yeah, there was this old excitement, going to the Registry of Deeds, finding those book and page numbers, right? Before they threw, got rid of them all. You know, if you finally got your way into the back room, you know, I don't know if people have done this kind of research, but there's all these plastic kind of folders in the front. But if you worked your way back and got to the back room, they were the original big bound documents, which are all gone now. Everything has been digitized. But I did an order, and this is uh, really the next one we came up with. And it really was kind of fun and one of my favorites. So, if we looked at that Eaton's Village lots, uh, Elijah, Elisha Hammond bought a lot in Eaton's Village lots. That's Elisha Hammond. He was a portrait painter. Uh, the way he heard about the Northampton Association, he was painting the portrait of William Lloyd Garrison, who recruited him to come to the Northampton Association. Um, and he painted this portrait of Frederick Douglass when Douglass was here one month before his most famous of all slave narratives was published. So, Douglas was in Florence sitting for this portrait one month before he had basically had to leave the country for his own safety for two years after he published the narrative of uh, Frederick Douglass. So it's, a, it's an amazing thing that we know that and we know that from these letters that were found in basically in an attic down in uh, Brooklyn, Connecticut, and donated to Historic Northampton, out of which the, this book came. Okay, and in the letters they say Frederick's here sitting for his portrait. It's a, it's a good likeness. He's not feeling very well. Right. And um, my sense is it was a because it looks so much. The pose is so much like the frontispiece of the narrative of Frederick Douglass, but that was done first. That that engraving and. Uh, Hammond set him up to look, uh, pose like this. I'm sorry, roughly, but, roughly what time period we're talking about? This is 1845. And thanks also to that uh, book, we know that the, little, the house, this house went up on June 19th, 1845. Because they say Hammond's house is being raised right now, right? You can imagine this little house being raised. This house, again, it could be a turn of the century house, the turn of the 20th century, like a 1900s house, right? But you go in, it's all timber framing. Elisha Hammond, uh, his day job was to be a plasterer and a, and a stucco guy. That's what he did for making money. We all know about that, but you have to have day jobs. And I knew that, and so this is one of those cases, I saw the guy out in his, Mr. O'Brien out in his lawn, right? I said, is there any chance that's stucco under there? And he goes, how did you know that? So that house is all stucco underneath, un underneath here. 
And that was the overture that got us into the house, got us in to be able to look at the timbers, and it's all timber framing inside. We haven't taken this again as far as we, this house by any means, as far as we'd like to. Um, he was quite an esthete. We learn in there that he was wanting to have plantings at the Northampton. So he's talking about fountains and gardens and stuff, you know? That was his goal. He's also one of two Cosmian saints we know about. Uh, we know that he and his obituary held out for the most strong possible uh, women's rights language in the founding documents of the Free Congregational Society. So he was a feminist as well as an abolitionist. And he was uh, perhaps an underground railroad agent. All right, so. Huh. <laughs> so anybody know what this house is, perhaps? So this is the ho uh, house of David Ruggles. Okay. Uh, here's David Ruggles in a famous, and the only picture we have of David Ruggles. He's there in the center. This was a cartoon, an anti-abolitionist cartoon in New York City. The goal of the, um, the cartoonist was to have you know and recognize Ruggles, right? This is a lifelike depiction of Ruggles. Because this, if you know, oh shoot, that's what I do when I go to my pointer sometimes. If you know what Isaac Hopper looked like, that's what Isaac Hopper looked like. I was a friend of his, another underground railroad agent. So this is our only lifelike depiction of David Ruggles, uh, and it's the first depiction of an African American in a political cartoon as anything other than a monkey-like creature. Okay, and it was to have you avoid, avoid doing having business dealings with this guy. And right after that, she sat in jail for helping helping a fugitive slave. Um, and he, uh, quickly on him, he helped over 600 fugitive slaves. He founded the Vigilance Committee in New York City, including Frederick Douglass, was married in his apartment on Lisbonard Street in New York City. He got very sick uh, for, all, for all of his activity and probably got sicker by the allopathic treatments that were given to him, which amounted to poison, basically. He got very sick, blind, uh, Lydia Mariah Child, who we'll talk about later, uh, was down there in New York City, uh, living in Hopper's house, and recommended that uh, Ruggles come to the Northampton Association to recuperate, and that's what he did. And he nursed himself back to health over 18 months using the techniques of the water cure of Victor Prisnitz, and then became aware that he had talents for diagnosing people for water cure treatment and treating them. And, one of the things we found out that in all likelihood he started treating people in this house. This was a boarding house for teachers. This is one of the most storied houses in Northampton in my view. It started out as Dr. Barrett's oil mill uh, house. There was an oil mill, I think we'll see it later on, oil mill. Uh, this is a linseed oil mill up in Florence. This is where Dr. Barrett, who was a very rich man in, in Northampton, had his house uh, that he would go up to when he was dealing with the fields up there and probably workers worked in this house. There's elements inside this house that have a, that appear that it could have been more of a work workplace. Um, so that was the case. Then they rented, the Northampton Association rented it from um, rented it from Barrett and David Mack moved in uh, to the house and then the Stetson family came, and George W. Benson, who was the leader of the house, kicked, basically kicked Mac out of the house and, and installed the, the Stetsons there. And then Mac pleaded with Dolly Stetson while James is away, we need to, I need a place to do the school. So uh, they start, you know, this was one of the places they taught kids and also where teachers lived. Mac moved back <coughs> in. Dolly said, yeah, I'd rather not, I'd rather be in the boarding house. So she left. Um, and then uh, one of the great stories about the house, this can't get very long, was the story of Harriet Hayden. Okay. Harriet Hayden and Sidney Southworth married each other without benefit of clergy in the community. Okay. They announced that they had um, completed the marriage relation to the assembled crew in, in, at the dining hall at the Northampton Association. And we know from this book that David Ruggles was chosen to go talk to them and tell them they were no longer welcome here. They were not going to be construed as any kind of this kind of thing. 
This was the period of the Oneida Commune, right? Mm -hmm. Of noise and, and, and sort of group marriage and that kind of thing. This was not going to happen at the Northampton, so you got to leave. She left. She went out to another place called the Prairie Home Community in Ohio, got tuberculosis, and begged to come back to die at the North Campbell Association. They brought her to this house to die. And they carried her body along Pine Street and buried her. And, and we, we worked on this in, in our article on the Pioneer. I wrote a little piece about Harriet Hayden and this, this very romantic piece uh, in the Gazette that was written about her down to where she was buried. So uh, Amanda and I tried to get the closest place we could to where she was buried and go down there. It's actually conservation land. We still, Northampton still owns it. So anyway, that's, that's what these houses can do to you, you know? <laughs> and, you, and, uh, and, and it's mnemonic, right? It helps old people remember things, I think. But also, um, you can approach it from the people, and the houses get you to the people, you know? And the address, Steve? This is 47 Florence Road. It was moved there, OK? And this is the rest of the story of the house. It was moved there after David Ruggles, okay, with um, maybe, you know, he had 30 or 40 patients at any one time. He built the water cure up to quite a big thing. I should have a picture of the water cure right here, but uh, after he died. But he got sick again and died on December 16th, 1849 at the age of 39. So it's partly why you haven't heard of him. He's not a widely known person. He was in his day. Everybody knew who David Ruggles was in the abolitionist community, both in New York and in Boston. He was one of the best known of all. Um, so they, <laughs> so it turned out the water cure was almost one of the biggest industries in Florence at that point, 1849. The community had broken up in 1846. Uh, and it kind of went bankrupt. Uh, Samuel Hoyle took on a lot of debt and hadn't yet really established the Nonatuck Silk Company, which wouldn't be established until 1855, which took over the silk business. They kept doing silk on a small basis, but the water cure was a big deal. So they brought in a Prisnitz trained, um, German trained uh, hydropathist by the name of Charles Mund, and he uh, said, I don't want this house here, and they moved it to Florence Road. And, and it's an interesting, you, know, you never know. I, you know. I'm a romantic. I gotta fight my romantic and romanticism all the time for this stuff. Because we have a deed where six acres are sold to Basil Dorsey. Remember we talked about it, to buy his new house down there. Six acres, but one acre reserved. And that on that one acre was reserved is where they put Ruggles House in 47 Florence Road. And living there, um, when Hannah Randall bought it, um, was William Wright a fugitive slave, one of the fu Florence 10 fugitive slaves, uh, or the Northampton 10 fugitive slaves we'll talk about later. But um, so Hannah Randall, a black operative at the water cure, came into possession of David Ruggles' small house and it was moved to the hill on South Street. We had this from two places, 1904 article by Arthur G. Hill and his recollections uh, late, uh, in Mecca. So one of the things you, about this particular house, it was the easiest find of all. Here's the 1860 map. There's Hannah Randall's house. It's the only one. Uh, if you go along here, there's two houses there and houses beyond here. But in 1860, it's the only house there. Right? So it wasn't very hard at all to, and then the deed work, only after Hunt ran, only three more people owned it. The Goodgens, do people know the Goodgens in Florence? The Goodgens lived there. And there was a rumor that it was owned, that African Americans lived in the house in, the, in their family history, but they didn't know where it came from. And inside, you see this kind of timber frame structure, this really kind of rough. There's the basement. There's the floor joist and, and flooring, the first floor. Okay, so that's the story of the David Ruggles house. Um, so in 1845, and we really get a lot of detail about it in these letters, George W. Benson um, comes up with a plan to sell off that mill, and 80 people were living in that mill at the same time they were manufacturing 
they were manufacturing silk in this floor and 80 people were living in this floor. So Jerner Truth was the superintendent of the laundry department, which was down in the basement. They broke, they one of the great things about this, they thought out this democracy, right? The members of the departments elected their leaders. It wasn't like the man, the, it wasn't like the board of directors appointed leaders for the departments. It came up, which is just how Rainbow Grocery out in San Francisco is organized. Um, very similar grassroots democracy. Where was this located? This is right across the street from the David Ruggles Center. So this would be um, right at the corner of Maple and Riverside Drive. It's where Indigo Coffee Roasters and Marnie Electric is. Marnie Electric, that building mm -hmm. was added to the outside edge of that, this building. That was added in the 20s out here. This was torn down in 1968. So, George W. Benson, and this is Sam, uh, William Lloyd Garrison's brother-in-law, you know, a real uh, diehard reformer, radical Garrisonian abolitionist of the truest stripe for some strange reason, comes up with a plan to go into manufacturing cotton in the mill and to have the community sell off 100 acres and give them the mill too. And sell it to these evangelical, conservative, orthodox abolitionists downtown. This is J.P. Williston. And this happens. This is what happens. Um, one of the, I realize now one of the few indications uh, that the community was raising silk as an alternative to cotton, just like Lady Mariah Child is will found was raising sugar beets as an alternative to slave grown sugar cane, is in the letters because Hill, Judd, Ford will never go into cotton, Dolly Stetson says. Mm -hmm. And that's maybe the only indication we have that there were objections to what was going on. But they did it. The ship was sinking. So they got a lot of money. And they laid out, just remember we saw Eaton's Village lots almost at exactly the same time. Um, and both of them are a response to this ending of the Northampton Association. They laid out uh, Bensonville village lots. So the, the company now, the cotton mill company was now called Bensonville Manufacturing Company with George W. Benson as the president and J.P. Williston and Samuel Williston of Williston Academy fame and Buttons and all that mm -hmm. as uh, Samuel was the president actually of the board uh, as the silent partners. Probably J.P. was managing it, uh, probably more, because he, he was a manager type. So they laid this out. <coughs> and lot number 12, they sold in 1849 to Basil Dorsey. Uh, and this is the house he built. We say, I say it like that because he bought it for $25. He bought the lot and then built the house. Um, and so here it is. Um, it's a really wonderful find in a way. Uh, again, Arthur G. Hill, uh, a later fugitive slave who we'll talk about owned the house. He says Thomas H. Jones' house was the second house from Cross Hill. Right? I didn't know what Cross Hill was. Nobody in Florence knew what Cross Hill. Kimball Howes did. He says, yeah, Cross Hill is the hill that goes down in Nottetuck Street. That's the hill. Two doors over in, in this day was this house. Right. So that's how we got there. I, this one, I pestered the owner for six months before he finally left me in. And I only got it, I had to call him in his yard again. I said, I'm the one that's been calling you all this time. And we've become great buddies. And he let, lets, us, lets us in his house, you know, uh, if we want to, when we have tours sometimes. Uh, Basil Dorsey was a fugitive slave from Liberty, Maryland. This is the plantation he came from. He was assisted by this guy, Robert Purvis, one of the great uh, Underground Railroad agents and abolitionists from Philadelphia. Uh, he's a black man. He identified as African American. He was three quarters white, one quarter black, and was uh, and, and identified as black very strongly. He was rich. This is Basil Dorsey's brother Thomas, who escaped with him. And so we don't have a picture of Basil. We do have a picture of, that, of Thomas. About the case, he because uh, he had harbored them out on his farm and neighbor's farms in this area. So they were actually his responsibility in a way because he had gotten them there. Um, and the, so the story is that the, the uh, judge overturned the case because the prosecutor couldn't prove to his satisfaction that slavery was the law of the land in Maryland. 
because he wanted the original documents. He wanted them to bring up the original thing. And so he got off. They tried to capture him again. He comes up. Uh, and in a classic kind of communication between Philadelphia and New York on the Underground Railroad, uh, Purvis sends him on to uh, David Ruggles and Joshua Levitt. And he goes on up to Charlemont. Um, I don't have, I, I didn't wanted to keep this a little uh, shorter than the full Basil Dorsey thing because it goes on. So he ends up in Florence. His first wife dies. His, he and his two kids settle in Florence. He marries again. And this is uh, the 1850 census that shows Basil with Cynthia and these kids uh, and then somebody named Jacob Benson. That could be named for George W. Benson. You know, that they could have selected. I've seen that in many other cases, fugitive slaves naming themselves for abolitionists they admire or whatever. I mean, that happens. Ezekiel Cooper is one of them. If you look up Joseph Wilson and Ezekiel Cooper, who we're about to talk about, both of them are white abolitionists. Um, <clears throat> So here we go. So um, in 18, March 1st, 1852, Basil Dorsey sells this house and moves down to that first house we saw of his, down at 4 Florence Road. Gets his six acres uh, and has a sort of compound of Dorsey family, uh, people and houses down there. And in 1854, this gentleman moves into the house, uh, Thomas H. Jones, a fugitive slave from uh, Wilmington, North Carolina, wrote a famous slave narrative. Um, and used whips, yokes, and chains in his demonstrations of slavery. He kept them from slavery days. Uh -huh. He had thrown himself overboard on, uh, uh, in New York Harbor, making a, a makeshift raft, and he paddled into New York Harbor, and came up to Salem, then came over here, and his wife bought the property here at Basil Dorsey's house, uh, and then he uh, Lived there until 1859 and moved on to New Bedford, where he lived out his days. So, uh, does anybody want to take a break, or are we good? I mean, I, I have maybe 15 more minutes, I guess, is what we should, is that about right? What time we got? Would that work for you? Keep it at 15? Because, uh, yeah. And that gives us a little slot. I, I've been sort of telling people that the walk would start at 1230, so. Okay. What is, what is it now? It's noon. All right, good. Well, we may spill over a little, but not much. <laughs> um, this is a, um, you know, so you get these documents, right, that, that help you go to the next step in, in this stuff. So here it is. The Fugitive Slave Act was passed in September 18th of 1850, more than doubling the penalties for helping fugitive slaves, deputizing citizens to, if you know about fugitive slaves, to turn them in. You know, it was a really uh, horrible new law that they put out as the Compromise of 1850. It's how Daniel Webster became shunned in Massachusetts because he was, this was part of what he put through. Um, and so here is a piece published in the Gazette, signed by 10 fugitive slaves. And it basically says, the undersigned fugitive from Southern slavery, respectfully call your attention to the law recently enacted. Uh, for our liberty, peaceful, and quiet behavior in our adopted state, we fearlessly challenge investigation. Um, and so they, it's a very strongly worded thing that we are citizens. We are, endowed, we are entitled to all of the uh, rights of citizenship because they had indeed bought their houses, as it turns, as it turns out. And so that was the next step uh, was, um, Going, uh, here's Basil Dorsey. Um, we don't know about William Randall yet. We have a suspicion, but we don't know for sure. And I'll mention our suspicion. We have Joseph Wilson. We have William Wright, Henry Anthony, and Louis French. All of them are Florence fugitive slaves. When did you say that was published? Uh, this was published October 15th, 1850, and was calling Northampton to meeting in our brand new city hall, you know our word city hall downtown? Yeah. <laughs> our brand new city hall, this is one of the first meetings there, was to resist the Fugitive Slave Act. Okay. Um, so, we, we, I started to look, all I really did was look in 
go to the card catalogs in, at the deeds to find out who these people were, right? Yeah, I found, I found the ones that were in Florence because they had bought property. So, you know, things develop, and this is, we started this in 2001, I guess. In that time, Google Earth came on. I think it's, you know, it's just <laughs> celebrated its 10th anniversary, right? YouTube and Google Earth in 10 years. But uh, what it allowed you to do was to overlay that map, Bensonville Lots map, over our current, our current uh, situation, which has turned out to be really helpful for confirming things, right? And so you go, here's lot number 12, and there's the Basil Dorsey house. And in the deeds, we learn that uh, lot number four, right, was owned by Joseph Wilson. Okay, and there's, and there's his house. So that was, by itself was enough to, and you look at the house, you go, well, it's another one of those ones. It doesn't look quite like the day. You go in, it's all timber framing. That house was crazy because they have a, this thing, they were very, I love these folks, but we came in and what do you want? You know, what do you want? And I go, we think your house may have been the whole, oh God, you know, if you just see them, there's all sorts of ghost stories in that house. That house is, that house is haunted, right? And so we made them nervous because, oh my gosh, what could, you know? So, um, and also, uh, and if you keep going, you can also overlay, this is an 1895 map, because you can, it can help you check against what's still there or not, you know what I mean, or what's been added. Mm -hmm. So that I love doing these kind of things. It's always tough to get them lined up exact. It's not an exact science, because for one, you don't know how good the map, maker are, map makers were, but it really helps. So that's uh, 133, the Joseph Wilson house. This is 129, uh, which we're pretty sure is the Ezekiel Cooper house. Uh, I didn't put up their census thing, but they're, they're right in a row in the census. And um, I'll, I'll bet, should, I have a picture of Chris Thompson, but we go into the, I go into these houses after doing the research with a wonderful uh, restoration carpenter, Chris Thompson, who inspects the floor joists and does all the, and I write down measurements that he's told me, you know, this many over, and we found out interesting framing techniques in this, this wing of this house, which he, not, he, his theory is that's the oldest, that was what the house was, this wing. Uh -huh. If you go down Ryan Road on the right, there are houses almost that small on Ryan Road yeah. that you start, you can see them. So, um, and here's the, uh, this is what it looks like in their attic, they let us look mm -hmm. in there. I wonder how old this wallpaper is. You know, it's probably good it goes back, but you love it when things haven't been touched, you know. So we did our thing in that house, and uh, we haven't done dendrochronology on that house. Uh, and that's basically it for now for Nonatuck Street until we come back with the most recent discoveries. This is Henry Anthony's house. Um, you know, in a way, it wasn't. Into, if you cared, you could find this house pretty easily. Again, because the deed trail is so short. Um, Henry Anthony is uh, the longest tenured African American in Florence history. Mm -hmm. Fought in the War of 1812. Um, was a fiddler and a farmer. Bought land from the Northampton Association, and we uh, went into this house last year. Chris, that's Chris Thompson, with the owner. Um, and we went in and looked around at the house uh, and really confirmed this is a very old construction. And we believe uh, Henry Anthony may have been work, uh, working for the Childs when they were doing their sugar beet experiment. So this is another great little find. I, uh, in Sheffield's history, there was the mention that the uh, George W. Benson cottage was moved down to uh, the corner of Landy Street and River Road. Just a mention of that, right? The George W. Benson Cottage would have been one of the very earliest buildings associated with the Northampton Association. Um, and if you research it, Samuel Whitmarsh, who started the Northampton Silk Company, built the cottage in a, probably around 1837 when he built that mill we saw, you know, the big mill. So, uh, I, I walked down to River Road and look at the houses and I go, that's a weird looking one. 
you know, it's kind of an odd, it's got an odd look to it somehow or other. The other houses don't look near this strange. They all look late 19th century. This one seemed odd to me. And I made an arrangement to go meet the owner, who was a man in very bad condition. I mean, this whole business of getting into people's houses for strangers' houses for no good reason, and, and, and they don't have time. They don't generally have time to clean up, but they kind of are curious, so you see things. He was, and uh, he died. House came on the market. Uh, it was George W. Benson's house. I Benson again. And. Uh, as it, luck had it, total luck. There was a bidding war over the weekend, um, and my partner, Chris Thompson, got the winning bid. So he owns the house, he rents it out, and he, and he does, that's his job, is he does uh, not just tasteful restoration, because he does, but, but uh, sort of uh, restoration that disturbs as little as possible. So he does that kind of thing. Okay, and then the other story we have. So, Two stories. One, we did dendrochronology on this house, and that's the dating of tree rings in timber-framed houses. Uh, and at, Bill Flint, at historic director of field, is the great sort of avatar of this process. And he has a whole database of different trees, chestnut, maple, right? And they did it. They found a good enough core, and we know this house was built in 1845. So it didn't, it didn't line up with what I wanted. But think of what had happened. This is my theory, right? 1845, that's when Benson sells off. That's when they buy the cotton manufacturing, right? And, we, and at that time, we know there's probably six, seven people living in this house, right? That this is an addition they built. And there's even a hole in the, uh, you can't see it. We have to document that house a little better for pictures. Uh, and there, uh, so this is in all likelihood the house the, that was added on to, but I think he got a little money in the deal. So he was able to add to his house in 1845. Um, and when the wheels came off and people had to move out of the big factory building, Sojourner Truth had to find another place to live. And she moved here. She moved in with the Benson family. And if this is true, if this pans out, this is where she began dictating her slave narrative, her narrative of her life to Olive Gilbert. Um, so that's why it's, uh, I love this little house. You know, and it's, you know, people know where Landy, do you know where uh, Maine's field is? One of the oldest continuously operating baseball fields in the country, Maine's field, uh, on River, Riverside Drive. And here's, uh, here's, here's our factory. Um, here's where the house would have been, probably right about here, or possibly here. And I think it was moved when A.L. Williston, who lived in this big mansion, built this carriage house, which I think was never built. I, I think he talked the map maker into putting it there <laughs> in 1879, because it was in the works or something. I don't know. It's odd. We, I don't see much any remnants of this house on this street, but maybe hey, there would be. Can you name the streets? All right, this is Maple, okay. going all the way down uh, to Nonatuck Street, all right? Here's Nonatuck Street. Um, here's the David Ruggles Center. Um, here's Indigo Coffee Roasters right here. This boarding house is still there. And so this is where they moved the house, right there. This is Riverside Drive. This is Landy Avenue. <laughs> you know, you just start in. So look at this house. It's an interesting house, I think. Right? And it is where we believe the house that Lydia Mariah Child and David Lee Child had to live when they moved to Florence. Lydia Mariah Child was perhaps the most famous woman author of the day. She published a bestseller called The Frugal Housewife. She opened the first children's magazine, the Juvenile Miscellany. She was one of only two women to have a library card at the Boston Athenaeum. She was way up there. Her brother was Converse Francis, one of the inner circle of the Transcendentalists, and she educated herself using his library. She's a wonderful writer, and they moved. Uh, she, I should have this picture if I'm going to tell this story. She wrote, in 1833, she wrote something that people did not expect from her at all. 
is called an appeal in favor of that class of Americans called Africans. And it burst on the scene as the best documented, documented condemnation of Southern slavery which had been written to that point. It became a handbook for abolitionists, but boy, people boycotted her works. Sales of a frugal housewife dried up. She closed her magazine. She lost her library card. Uh -huh. and this is in Massachusetts, you know. This is abolitionist Massachusetts. This is the price she paid for publishing that in 1833. So David was never good at making money. In fact, he was fighting a lawsuit at the time. He was known to libel people in print. Um, so uh, she was the money maker in the family. They co concocted a scheme to raise sugar beets as an alternative to slave-grown sugar cane. They moved to North. David went off, got trained in the process in France, came back. Uh, they moved into Duckett House here at Smith College. Um, and they won an award for the first beet sugar manufactured in the country. Uh, in Bolden, they bought 100 acres of land up in Florence, um, in this area here. They moved their beet sugar manufacturing equipment into the uh, Josiah White linseed oil mill and bought this land down here. And we're supposed to live in a little shanty called, this was called the Swamp House at the time. So we, this was before Florence Road hooked up to East Hampton, right? But they were going to be living down here. This is basically swampland. They couldn't raise anything that first year on the swampland. Their shanty, their shanty, this is where they put their oil mill, uh, uh, their, their beet sugar manufacturing equipment. And there's the shanty they were going to live in. Um, and they couldn't live there, so they had to rent and not only had to rent land, but they had to rent a house on top of everything else. Things were not going well for them. So uh, I put together this theory because we have this uh, statement that um, Child was also one time, this is from David Lee Child's obituary. Child was also at one time engaged in the experimental manufacture of beet sugar at the old grist mill near the present brush shop on the opposite side of the road. The house he occupied has since been moved up the hill and now stands on Meadow Street near Cosby and Hall. Right? And we had this other story was Morris McCall has purchased a, a building site from Mrs. Mary Bosworth on Meadow Street, Florence, uh, on which he contemplates erecting a residence the coming season. He has also bought the Dr. Moon Cottage near the works of Florence Manufacturing Company on Pine Street, which cottage is making a transit bodily from its old location to the new site. Those are, are one and the same building. Um, Dr. Moon ended up owning that house where the Childs had rented. Um, and uh, so, uh, here's, here's a great one, and it says, uh, Charles Sheffield writes that jo Josiah White lived in a, it was the Josiah White cottage in all these deeds, lived at, at a cozy cottage he built soon after 1810, right, between the present brush shop and the old silk mill boarding house, nearly opposite the large button ball tree. <laughs> I always loved that kind of thing. Yeah. So, <laughs> Uh, it was afterwards moved to Meadow Street, where it was enlarged and remodeled, and is now the second house west of Willow Street. So that is this house, right? I should have another picture of that in mind. But that's this house, still looking nothing like it, right? And what we're, we're looking for now is an 1810 frame inside this house. And there it was. Here's the old. Oh, yeah. There's the old rafter again. Uh, luckily, this guy had this picture when he did a renovation. And it's a chestnut. It's a chestnut. His back sill is a. I forget how long. Thirty-six foot chestnut beam like this. Wow. You know? wow. And so there it is. That old house inside this other house was moved there by Zenas Field, the movingest man in Florence. <laughs> and they moved, and this is another thing why we have these houses. They didn't tear them down, they moved them to wherever they were going to. The Benson Cottage was moved, the Ruggles House was moved, this house was moved. Okay, uh, what time is our time? I think this is a good time yeah. to okay. bring it to I'll right, just show you a picture. Uh, this is another, this is uh, Charles Burley. This is his house up on Main Street. 
And I just had to show you that picture. Aww. That's Charles C. Burley. Uh, you need to, well, he, you'll hear more about him in the days to come. He was the speaker of the Free Congregational Society, one of the great abolitionists of all time, swore never to cut his hair or beard until slavery was ended. And this oh is this wonderful God. daguerreotype we have down at, remember why I'm here, historic Northampton. <laughs> <laughs> and Marie might get that out and show it to you someday if you want it. Um, it's a wonderful picture. And uh, remember us over there if you want to take any of that material and just mull it over. You know how these donation things sit in your yeah. outbox until yeah. you finally make the right choice. <laughs> Thank you so much.